So this one uh, really is, you know, kind of an add-on to whatever we have studied. So we have studied about sorting integers. Now I'm asking, can we sort strings or other data types? And since all of you have already gone through the slides, let me just go to the primary slide here. Uh, so, you know, instead of integers, now I have some strings like names of students and I want to lexicographically sort them, which means I want to sort them in the dictionary order. So any name starting with A should appear before any name starting with B. If there are two names starting with B, then I should look at the next letter and if I appears before U, then that name should appear before the other name. Okay, so that's the lexicographic sorting. And how do we do this? So, you know, this is just like selection sort, but applied on strings. What we're doing is we're saying that, remember in selection sort, what did we do? We basically looked at the entire array, found out the element which should go to the topmost position. So, so how did we do this? We looked at this entire array and we found the maximum element and we put it in its rightful position. So here instead of the maximum element, we'll find the lexicographically first element, the element that appears first in the dictionary order. So that is Anu in this case. So we put it in the topmost position and then we have the remainder of the array which is still left to sort. In this array, we'll find ex again the lexicographically first element, the first that appears in the dictionary order. We'll put it in the next, next position and then we'll have the remainder of the array to sort. So it looks like if we can select the lexicographically first element in an unsorted subarray, then we can just apply our same idea of selection sort and actually lexicographically sort this array of strings. Right? Because the basic idea is to choose what should be the first element. So if I can figure out from a given array of strings what should appear first in the dictionary order, then I'm done. Now, how did we find out the maximum element in an array of integers? We really iterated over that array. We compared every for every pair, which element was greater than that. So here also we're going to do the same thing. We're going to iterate over the array and we're going to compare pairs of elements, right? So basically what we really need is a mechanism of comparing a pair of strings and figuring out which one of them should appear before the other in the dictionary order. So that is the lexicographic ordering, right? And if we can do that, then in a given array, I can just iterate over that array and find out what is the lexicographically first string, move it to the topmost position, and then just repeat it for the remainder of the array. Right? And I would automatically end up sorting the array in lexicographic order. So let us assume for the time being that this function, which tells us whether one string is lexicographically before the other, is given to us. We are going to study about you know, strings and character arrays, and then we will see how to do this. It's not very hard to do, but let us for the time being assume that we're already given a function which takes two strings. So here I've represented, here I've written strings String is a special data type that is available in C++. However, if you want to use us them as character arrays, that's fine. You can use them as character arrays. And what this function is going to do is, it's going to return true if the first string is lexicographically earlier than the second string. Otherwise, it will return false. So let us not worry about how this function is implemented. This is the contract view of function. I just know its preconditions and post conditions. And let me use that in the uh, algorithm for selection sort. So basically in this loop, if you remember this was the main loop for selection sort, we had current top going from 0 to n minus 1, which was telling us the unsorted part of the array. And there we found the index of the maximum element earlier. Here we're going to find the index of the lexicographically first element. And then we're just going to swap it with current top. Right? It's as simple as that. How do we find index of the lexicographically first element? We just iterate over the part of the array. And earlier we had compared whether AI was greater than A current index max. Now we'll just check if AI is lexicographically earlier than A current index max. So this is the comparison uh, current, uh, whatever, current lex first index. So this is the only difference between the two, right? Instead of using the greater than comparison over integers, now I'm using the lexicographical ordering over two strings. And that's it. And is it the case that uh, we just got lucky with selection sort and this won't really work if we try to do merge sort. If you go and look at what we did for merge sort, really in merge sort, when we were trying to merge two sorted subarrays, we looked at the two elements pointed by the two arrows, and we figured out which one of them should appear before the other, and we put that in the sorted array. So it's really that same question. Given two, two elements, which one should appear before the other? So if there were two strings, I can use the same lex earlier uh, function to find out which one of them should appear before the other, right? 
So, so that's given here. So I will not go through that because this is really the same thing, except that in this merge thing, whenever we were comparing two elements to figure out which one of them should go earlier in the sorted array, we are now going to have this comparison. If AJ is lexicographically earlier than AI, then I'll copy AJ to temp A. Otherwise, I'll copy AI to temp A. Is that clear? The rest of it is absolutely the same. And of course, you should sort of rename your variables accordingly so that they, they, they are more meaningful. Earlier, we were sorting integers, so it was index of max, so maybe we should now call it index of lexicographically first or something, right? And uh, what do we do if we have arrays of other data types, let us say floats, doubles, or other more complex data types that we're going to study soon? Uh, it turns out that we really have to do the same thing. We just have to come up with an ordering function for two elements of the data type, for two objects of the data type. And as long as we can order two objects of the data type, we can do selection sort. Selection sort is really finding the earliest element in a given array. So if you just keep comparing pairs of elements, you'll find the earliest element. In merge sort, when you're merging, you have to find the earliest of two given elements. So as long as you have an ordering operator, it's fine. Okay, good. So, uh, and this is certainly not the end of sorting. I mean, there are far more interesting techniques used for sorting. So I've just listed some of them here. You know, I encourage all of you to at least spend five or 10 minutes looking up Wikipedia on these things. Very interesting area of study. Uh, what we have studied is selection sort, which is probably one of the simplest but not so efficient sorting techniques, and merge sort, which is actually a real life sorting technique. In fact, merge sort is used in a lot of practical applications because it has a very good running time, as we just saw, right? Are there any doubts in this part of the lecture? Which is the most efficient sort? That's a good question of the different sorting techniques. So of selection sort and merge sort, the answer is clear. So, so yeah, so what you can show is that if you do a comparison based sorting where you're comparing two elements and then trying to figure out which goes earlier or the other, then you need a minimum of n times log n based two basic steps. This can be proven mathematically. In So any sorting technique, if it is using comparisons to figure out which should go before the other, doesn't, for example, selection sort also use that, merge sort also use that, quick sort, heap sort, insertion sort, all of these techniques are going to use that. So any comparison based sorting technique must use in the worst case n times log n based two comparisons. So in some sense, this is optimal for the worst case already, right? However, the average case running time may be much faster for, so these are all the worst case running times. In the worst case, you'll ha have to have this many steps. So the average case running time could be faster for some kinds of data, you know, for example, if I know my data is almost sorted, but there are just some elements which are not sorted, then I could come up with a different technique which may actually just quickly find out those things. So there are more sophisticated algorithms which will work for special kinds of data. If you know some properties of the data, we can make it work for those. Uh, but if you're using comparison-based sorting and if you want to sort the entire array, no assumptions about the data in the array, one can mathematically show that you need in the worst case, at least n times log n base two comparisons. So in the worst case, merge sort is already, but in practice, you know, for example, quick sort, that's why it's called quick sort, usually turns out to be faster than, so we're not going to cover quick sort, uh, at least in the lectures. It turns out to be usually faster than merge sort, although in the worst case, the behavior is the same. Okay, good question. Okay, so now uh, we'll look at the third one, which is actually, uh, no, this is more like, uh, you know, once you have a sorted array, you can do so many nice things with that. So, uh, you know, let me quickly go through this. So the searching problem is very simple. You're given an array of integers. You're given a particular integer n, let us say, and you're, you're asking is n present in A, right? And what we want is, if n is indeed present in A, we want you to give us the index in A where n is present. Otherwise, we want you to return minus one. So here are some sample examples. If, if this is my array and if n is 27, then I should return four because a four is 27, right? And if this is my array and I, n is 23, then I should return minus one because minus one is, uh, because 23 is not in the array. And if I'm asking for 24, there are two 24s in this array. So I could return either one of them, okay? So it's okay to return any one of the matching. Now, the simplest way to do this is, uh, you know, let me directly go to the code, is to actually do what is called a linear search. So linear search means you just iterate over the array, 
and if the current element matches the search element, then you say, yes, I found it. Otherwise, you say minus one. I've gone through the entire array and I've not found the element, right? But how many basic steps is it going to take if the array has n elements? It's clear that it will take n basic steps. You really have to look at every element in the array in the worst case, right? So basic steps is n. And the question is, can we do better? And in order to do better, what we'll do is, we'll first take the array and then we'll sort it, okay? So that, that is the original array and this will sort it. So, so here let me uh, try to also mention this, that given an array, when we are searching elements in the array, so, so in a lot of real life problems, what's going to happen is you're given one array, maybe of size one million, and then maybe you want to make another one million searches on that array. So that array stays the same, but you want to make a lot of searches on that array. You want to find out whether some element is present, some element is not present. So you want to ask questions about the presence or absence of elements in the array a very large number of times, right? So given an array, the total number of searches we might make on the array might be very large. It's not usually not just one element. So what we are saying is given the array, let's pay this one time price of sorting the array. And then can we speeden up each of the searches that we're going to do, right? So it's a one time cost that we pay because after that we're going to make a lot of searches. And after that we'll see if we can speed up the search, okay? So what we will do is, so, so in this example, this was our sorted array. And we'll first find out the middle element in this array. So that's 24. And because this array is sorted, now I have this guarantee that the part above it is greater than or equal to 24. And the part below it is less than or equal to 24. So if I'm searching for 18, it absolutely does not make sense to search in this part because all elements here are greater than or equal to 24. So we'll just throw that part out from our consideration and focus our search in this part of the array. But now it is again a smaller but simpler problem. I'm trying to search an element in a smaller array. So I'll use the same technique. I'll go to the middle element and I know that this, the part above it is greater than or equal to 18 because it is sorted in decreasing order. The part below it is less than or equal to 18. And in this case, the middle element is indeed 18, so I'm done. I've found the element that I was looking for. In general, I may have to, you know, further select which half of the subarray, if, if the middle element doesn't match, I have to figure out which half of the subarray should I focus my search on. But in any case, at every step, you are keeping on halving the size of the array, right? So at, at no step are you continuing with the same size of the array in the next step. So let me directly show this illustration. So suppose this is an array sorted in increasing order, and that is the midpoint, let us say. And we have a search element, and we've figured out that the search element is less than a mid. Now remember, I'm just making comparison with only the mid element, right? So this is just one comparison there. I make a comparison with the mid element, figure out that the element I'm searching for is less than a mid. And because this is sorted in increasing order, therefore there is no point searching in this part of the array. Because all of those will be greater than or equal to a mid. So I'll just remove that part and say that now I want to search in this part of the array, right? So again, I'll find the mid element. And let us say now I find that search element is greater than a mid, this a mid. So then there is no point searching in this part because this is sorted in increasing order. So I'll throw out that part and I'll restrict my search to this part. Again, I'll find the mid. I'll ask is search element less than or greater than mid. If search element is equal to mid, I'm done, I found it. Otherwise, I'll again throw out some part of the array and just keep doing this until I've found the element, right? So at every step, you're having it. And that's the basic idea. So this, this way of searching for an element is also called binary search. And uh, as you just saw, what we're going to do is, so in binary search, we're going to take an array A and A start through A and minus one. As you just saw, I had a large array and initially I was interested in this entire array, then I was interested in one half of the array, then I was interested in some other half of the array and so on. So at any point of time, I'll have to tell to this function which part of the array is, am I interested in. So the start and end basically do that job. I'm interested in the part of the array between the indices start and end minus one. And I'm interested in searching for this element, search element, and we must have the array sorted. So in what order are we going to assume it to be sorted? Let's assume that it is sorted in increasing order. And at the end, if the search element was already present in this array, then I want its index to be returned. Otherwise, I want minus one to be returned. So what do we do? We look at the termination case first. If the array has just one element, right, then if that element 
already matches my search element, then I can return its index. If that element does not match my search element, it's minus one because my array of interest just has one element. So either that element is the searched element or that element is not the searched element. Okay. The other case is when my array is of size greater than one. So what I'll do is I'll figure out its midpoint. So that is mid is start plus end over two. And then I'll check whether a mid is indeed equal to search element. If a mid is equal to search element, I'm done. I can return, right? Otherwise, if a mid is not equal to search element, then a mid is either greater than search element or less than search element. So if a mid is less than search element, then because this array is sorted in increasing order, I can now focus on the part of the array from mid through n minus one, only on elements greater than a mid, right? Otherwise, I'll focus on the part from start through mid minus one. It's the part containing less than a mid, elements less than a mid. Right, and that's it. That's what binary search is about. Uh, how do we search, uh, uh, search other data types? It's exactly the same way. As you can see, the, the crucial step here was I checked equality, which I can do for any data type, and then I needed to make this comparison. If a mid is less than search element or a mid is greater than search element. So once again, if I have a comparison operator for strings or for whatever other data type you want, I can actually do binary search. And in fact, the same comparison operator that you're going to use for searching, uh, for sorting, you can use that same operator for searching now to do the binary search, right? Good, how many basic steps? So if you look at the algorithm, uh, if, if the array is of size one, of course, there's just one basic step, right? And if the array is of size n, then we first make a comparison with the, we compute the index of the mid element, we compare with a mid, so I'm calling that a basic step, so that is one. So computing the index of the mid element, comparing with a mid, that is one basic step. And then determining which half of the array I should search in. But that is just half of the array, so it is tn over two. So tn is tn over two plus one. The termination case is t1 is one, and the solution for this is log n, okay? So this is log n, the earlier linear search was n, so this is exponentially better than the other one. And in fact, this is as efficient as you can get, you know. So one can show that if you're searching for an element in an array, in the worst case, you need to make at least login comparisons. So we'll start the uh, video quiz. I hope all of you have the uh, answer sheets. Okay. So recap quiz, first question is, which of the following is true of the implementations of selection sort and merge sort as taught in class. We have just now covered merge sort, we have seen at selection sort, we, we also looked at the code for selection sort. So as taught in class, which of the following is true? Both implementations were recursive, only the implementation of selection sort was recursive, only the implementation of merge sort was recursive, and none of the implementations were recursive. Right? As taught in class, which of them was recursive? Okay. It's an easy one, so let's go to the next one. So consider an integer array of size n. You already know the number of basic steps to sort a by selection sort. You know the number of basic steps to sort a by merge sort. So if I divide this and compute the ratio, this grows roughly linearly with which of these quantities? n over two raised to n, n over log n, log n over n, and n squared over log n. The growth of this ratio with n will be roughly linear with which one of these quantities. Okay, so if you know the number of basic steps, you can just divide them and you can see which are the dominating terms there and you can compute this ratio. By using an appropriate comparison operator, merge sort or selection sort can be used to sort an array of which data types, integers, characters, strings and double. Was more than one answer may be correct in any of the questions. Okay. Fourth question, binary search can be used to efficiently search for an element in an unsorted array, an array sorted in ascending order, an array sorted in descending order, all of the above. Okay. The last question, so in a recursive implementation of binary search, as we just saw a few minutes back, what happens in the termination case? So it always finds the searched element in the array. It may not find the searched element in the array. The termination case may happen when the size of the subarray being searched is greater than one 
and none of the above. So this is about the termination case of binary search. In the termination case, does it always find the searched element? May it not find the searched element? And in the termination case, can the size of the subarray being searched be greater than one? Okay, so TAs, if you could please collect the answer sheets and bring them here.